How can I use uh, Apple Vision Pro to create a business? So my suggestion would be try to look at the characteristics of this medium and try to understand it. Oh, you can do something that you were used to do in a certain way and completely forget about how you used to do it. Uh, I can make a simplistic example. You have your collection of books in your bookshelf, for instance. Imagine be able to, you know, take that box of books and throw it in space and now all of a sudden they're flying in front of you. You could cluster them, you could think about how do you move them, and that will be embracing the medium right rather than having shelves or web pages that you can scroll. Hello and welcome to PolyWeb. I'm your host, Sara Landi Tortoli, and my guest today is Pierluigi Della Rosa, interaction designer at Human and formerly at Apple. In this conversation, we talk about special computing and the opportunities arising from the new interactions between humans and computers. I think this episode and this conversation couldn't have been more timely, really, like uh, without even knowing. Well, I, I do imagine you are referring to, you know, Apple releasing the new headset and you know, my background as an interaction designer, I've been, you know, l- working in spatial computing for many years. And, you know, now spatial computing is the world of many. I work for a emerging autonomous driving startup in the Bay Area. And there is where I, I really, you know, you, you can think of the car as one computing system in some way. And with the, you know, with the advent of autonomous driving, there is more space that you're going to sp- spend inside uh, inside a car. So there is a lot of the digital coming in and offer opportunities for interactions there. And after that, I worked at Apple. And at Apple, I was part of the team that was uh, inventing and uh, kind of prototyping the future of Apple in the home. And so that is also in some ways related to, you know, that's also related to to kind of this idea that computing is distributed, is not about, you know, you specifically, but, you know, as touch points, as a touch point on, you know, potentially a screen that is being there as touch points on your TV, as touch points on, uh, you know, voice agents that you can access in different parts of your home. And so it's really thinking about this, this idea that, uh, one, you know, interactive system can just like live around you and you can like seamlessly pass between one space and another and act on that interactive system in different ways. So I, I hope that gives a little bit of an overview of where I come from and what are the spaces that I've been uh, working on. Yeah, but maybe we can take a step back because uh, not every listener might be familiar with the word spatial computing. So maybe like we start with a little bit of ground knowledge that we need to follow the conversation. Sure. Into... <clears throat> spatial com- I mean, spatial computing is really a, a catchphrase that talks about the idea that computing is aware of the space where you are around and is able to track objects, people, surfaces, and is able, you know, spatial computing as an idea is the idea that, you know, you in your environment, you have touch points within that environment. That, and these touch points are distributed throughout, you know, the surfaces of, of the place where you are in. There are very many, play, many ways in which you can experience spatial computing. Uh, you can do it through different technologies as well. You can do it through projection and sensors. You can do it through headsets in which you know, there is a layer between you and the physical reality. That's, you know, the, what we uh, think of AR headsets. Uh, you can see the reality passing through or on a transparent display and you overlay to that image a layer of digital that enhances or just give you, you know, d- digital information in the space. So uh, situated in, in the environment that you're in. How does it actually work? I think at the most fundamental level, spatial computing works in this way. You have a sensor that senses, that has an understanding of, you know, the person in space. So is able to look to locate the person and uh, is able to locate potential interactions. Uh, one interaction could just be walking. If you've been in any 
you know, museum that has some interactive installation, you are familiar with this. You walk towards, you know, a projected screen and or a projection and something changes. So that's kind of one of the simplest, simplistic way of thinking of spatial computing. The advances in spatial computing and what we've seen this week is, you know, having a lot of sensors that are aware and that are able to reconstruct the 3D geometry of the space you're in. So they can see, you know, horizontal surfaces, flat surfaces, potentially recognizing what is a bed, what is a table, what is, you know, a chair, and what are the other people that are inside the space. And being able to situate in that space different, I would call them objects, but really what we have seen so far is, you know, pieces of UI, pieces of user interface that are actionable and in different levels. And they can be, you know, positioned in space. We have seen, I think we have seen this happen slowly with different players in the space. I think the vision that, you know, HoloLens has been probably the first headset that had that capability of sensing the space, creating these meshes and the mesh of the space, and then being able to situate objects there and keep that persistent in some way. So you could go back to that room and find things that you have left there. So I think this is kind of the fundamental level. It's not a new technology. This has been used in the military for many ways. People have been playing with this for, you know, I feel like this has been a long, long way coming, both in the, you know, popular imagination from, you know, Snow Crash to Ready Player One. Like people have have touched this technology with their imagination in different forms, but I think now it's coming to fruition more and more. What were the obstacles before to go from imagination to actually Apple releasing uh, the the headset Vision Pro? Because uh, they were supposed to release it before, but then it got delayed, uh, and now they are out uh, on the market. Like, what what were the difficulties? I mean, I, I you know I cannot talk in the specific, but you know if you think about the headset in general, special computing in general requires. A lot of technology, a lot of novel technology, a lot of computing power. Uh, you need to compute this mesh or this, uh, you know, mirror of the physical space you are in, and that is requires a lot of, you know, requires cameras, sensing, understanding depth, understanding objects around you, and from a user interaction perspective, it needs to track hands. It needs to track, you know, at least controllers, as we have seen before. And so all of these uh, have a cost computationally, and I think we have uh, we have arrived in a place in which, from a computing perspective and a computing and power perspective, because you know needing to wear in these devices required to have the compute on the asset itself, so or requires. You know we we have seen that to be external to the headset, but of course limits the potential of the headset itself. So if you need to be tethered to a computer, you, you cannot really walk around and really benefit from it as much as you can if you're, you're, you're wearing it and you can walk around and go places. So I think that those are, those are definitely big obstacles to spatial computing. I think we've seen spatial computing in other forms. We've seen it in you know project, projected AR uh, is a space that has been used by artists and professionals in the kind of uh, museum industry uh, to create immersive installations. That's, I think, is another aspect of spatial computing. A lot of the people that have been designing spatial computing experiences and they have been part of, you know, the teams at Apple, at Microsoft, at, uh, at Meta, they come from that world in which they have, they have a thinking that is very spatial, is more architectural in some ways. And they bring that understanding of the world to, to this new digital, digital and physical space. Mm. Okay, so that accounts uh, for for the difficulties and the delays. Uh, but now that the headsets are here, people are getting very, very excited about this, right? Uh, like I've seen uh, my LinkedIn feed that uh, you know moving from ChatGPT to Apple Vision Pro. Like uh, in the space of a second, basically. So people are getting very, very excited despite the price, which is uh, steep. But I think what most listeners uh, are asking themselves is uh, 
how can I use uh, Apple Vision Pro to create a business in a way that maybe I didn't do with ChatGPT because I was not paying enough attention, you know, but this time around, I'm there for it. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And probably there are many ways to answer this. I think one of the things I learned in the industry is to embrace the medium and really understand what are the what are the characteristics of the medium. So, you know, if you've been app designer, the the world in which you have lived in is this small screen, touch enabled. And so from an interaction design perspective, I would say try to understand what the medium really does. And I think the idea of having space to play with puts us in a completely different dimension or a, a, complete, a completely different way of thinking about the interface itself. So my suggestion would be try to, to look at the, at the characteristics of this medium and try to understand it. And you don't need to have the Vision Pro on your head. You can do, you know, you can do simple sketches on your phone and those I think are gonna be very helpful. There are a lot of tools that helps you to do that from you know unity to you know apple as this reality composer that you can use but the the thing that i think is really really interesting and think about oh you can do something that you were used to do in a certain way and completely forget about how you used to do it and try to think about how do you embrace the new medium and i want to make an example for instance i mean i, I can make a simplistic example you have your collection of books in your bookshelf, for instance. Imagine be able to, you know, take that box of books and throw it in space and now all of a sudden they're flying in front of you. And you could say, you know, you could, you could cluster them, you could think about how do you move them and that will be embracing the medium, right? Rather than having, you know, what we have seen in, you know, many of the interfaces we have where we have, you know, shelves or web pages that you can scroll. Uh, here we have a completely different medium. You have basically yeah, you, you can really play with that dimensionality and understanding how the inputs are offered to you. So I think that for me is a very, very important part of that. The, there are different, you know, there are different ways in which you can interact with spatial computing. If you look at Meta, you have this basically wants that you're holding. Apple, I think, has done something very different, very novel, and probably that works really well. You can just like, look at things and you can use your hands to select. So embrace. So my suggestion would be to get ready to that. Really embrace the medium. Really try to understand what the medium does. Don't think about, oh yeah, I can put you know a two D view here, and you're gonna have you know switches. You can rethink everything. Rethink how do we scroll through materials? How do we look at big information, a big quantity of information? Uh, you can you know rethink really everything that you know about computing in this new medium. I think that would be my my first suggestion. Really embrace. The new, the new medium, and and then try to, you know, forget what you know, and 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 come with new eyes, come with a beginner mindset to it. Can I ask you how do you do that? Uh, because it's often it's easier said than done, and you are really, really a smart, uh, a smart person uh, with an absolutely impressive career. Right. Uh, you, you went, you know, you made it from Italy uh, and uh, managed to arrive to Silicon Valley and been hired by Apple and now human. Right. Uh, so I wonder with your background, do you have a framework or a method uh, that can help listeners uh, rethink uh, things that they give for granted uh, so that they can see these new opportunities? I mean, I think, you know, I, I think one fundamental aspect of this is tools. Uh, I think tools, they mold the way you think. So if you are used to, you know, Figma, you think in a certain way, you think in this like big system design, but then, you know, you are very limited in the animations you can build. And so whatever you design is probably low on animation, but, you know, it's very comprehensive of your design system. If you use, you know, something like Illustrator, you are much freer, but then it lacks these other aspects. So I think it's reflecting on the tools, looking at the tools that you are using to create and seeing in the tools, understand what the tools are good for and understanding how they bias your thinking. 
And then, you know, design your own tools if you need to. I actually did design a platform for starting to play with more, more spe spatial interactions in the past to enable some of the kind of experiences in space and enhancing projection with interactions. So I think that the, the conversation that regards tools is a very important one. I think, I think looking for tools that enable to do that and that lets you express ideas in this new medium is important. And I think at the beginning, the tools that you're going to use, they're not going to be good enough or they're not going to be the one that are going to give you that advantage over what you already have. So I think it's a very... Uh, it's 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 not easy, but I think going back to the materiality of it and thinking, you know, in a, I think especially in spatial computing, you can, you know, almost forget about what you know about computing and really look around and think about, you know, what you can do with if if you had this kind of big freedom of throwing things around, of connecting things to your body. Those are the things that I think are going to be part of spatial computing and are going to be very interesting to explore. And I think they do pass through tools. So the conversation around tools, is, I think, is going to be an important one in the next year. So try to see what's coming up, see what this, the new tools are going to allow you. And uh, yeah, try to see how you, your craft adapts to the tools that are coming up and are made for, for this new headsets, new world that we're going to be exploring. Being a very practical person, I'm curious to know what are the most interesting uh, use case applications. So, of course, we talk about uh, the Apple headset, and we'll come back to that later. But for one second, I want to leave it aside uh, and ask you about uh, other area of, uh, of application that gets you particularly excited uh, and where we have a lot of progresses that maybe listeners are not fully aware of and could be another business opportunity, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think I personally, I'm really excited about, you know, spatial computing beyond that set. So seeing as we, we build, you know, this technology and these paradigms, but seeing that in expressed with projections in space without wearing a headset and having more tangible touch points, so rediscovering, you know, how we can, you know, touch things, tap on things, tap on surfaces, uh, having very nice working knobs. And I think a few companies are, you know, exploring that world. So I'm really fascinated by, by that space in which, you know, you know, is the uh, environment to wear the technology rather than you wearing the technology. So I'm really, really excited about that space. I think there are new, you know, I, I'm also very interested in, collaboration and computing, I think there is a lot to be designed there. I think we have been in this world of personal computing in which there is one user and one device, and that has been true so far. So you have one laptop, you sit in front of it, and it's just you. Uh, you have a smartwatch, it's the same. You have a, a smartphone, it's the same. You have a smart headset, it's the same. And I think there is a space that I think is going to become more and more relevant. It is I'm sitting with my friends and all of a sudden there is one computing system, one interactive system, but we have ways of affecting that interactive system at the same time. So yeah, I think, I think these aspects I think are pretty novel and I'm, I'm pretty excited about them. So I would say tangible user interfaces related to spatial computing or not, but you know, the, again, the environment wherein the technology rather than you and then I think on the other side, there's this aspect of collaborative computing and collective computing, I think is really, really interesting. So those are, those are two domains that I think are really, really interesting. You know, if you think about the, I mean, related also to what I was talking about, the, the, you know, this Vision Pro and headset are still pretty isolating technologies. And there are still technologies that mediates your reality from you know your experience, even if they are designed in a way in which they are trying to be you know cautious, and I think Apple has been good at doing that, really trying to bring the the inside in as much as they could. 
I think there is still this strong aspect of mediation between this layer of technology and the reality around you. And so I do believe that, yeah, I, I do believe that there is space for people that are doing it, or that are also looking at non-mediated experiences with reality. I think there is space for both. I would like to ask you, what is it like uh, to work at Apple? And mm-hmm. specifically, so I'm interested about uh, like the, the workplace culture and how teams are structured. Uh, and why is it that Apple manages uh, ongoingly, you know, to, to innovate? I mean, we can discuss if they have really been innovative uh, besides the ad set for the past uh, few years. I guess that now that the ad sets are out, uh, I feel like I kind of understand why the iPhone was not, you know, a groundbreaking uh, new piece of release uh, with, with every subs- subsequent model. So I feel like now I understand it better, but I'm curious, what do they do inside the company so that they can keep innovate? How do they organize their teams? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I think it's actually pretty simple as an, as an answer. I think that the thing that I would like to say is Apple, I think, is very clear what they do. And I think they do two things. They either make some technology simpler or they make something that is not accessible, accessible. So they make something that is luxurious available to people. And, and this is, I don't know, if you can think about, you know, the HomePod, you have this, you know, speaker that, you know, is relatively affordable, but it gives you this superb quality of audio. And so I think this is very clear inside. That's what Apple does. And I think the other way that is really good about our Apple structure is that, you know, other companies have business units. So you have a business unit that does this product, another business unit that does this other product, you have another unit that does this other product. And inside Apple, there are, you know, center of excellences for, you know, specific, yeah, specific uh, disciplines. So you have, you know, as, as specialized groups that does, you know, cameras and does it for all the products and as specialized group that does screens and does it for all the products. And so that basically gives the best mix of, you know, technology and, you know, output for the people that you have there. I think that's, that's really what makes Apple, you know, a, a, the structure of Apple very successful in that. So, you know, if multiple products have cameras, you know, there is a center of excellence that does cameras and they have a very specific brief this is where it needs to be packaged and, you know, that's what's needed. And so I think in that sense, you know, the cross-functionality happens because you need to build the product itself regardless, but you don't duplicate that effort in a different business unit. And this is, you know, is fairly true. I think there are exceptions within the organization, but, uh, but that I think is a winning strategy of structuring the company that way. And, you know, and then just, you know, the way in which you make decisions, I think, is, is also supporting of that. So before something makes it out, it needs to be looked at from many, many eyes before, before it can become a product. And, you know, if someone thinks that that's not the right quality, then they, they, that's not going to be a product, basically. So just having that quality control, I think, is what really makes the products stand out. What's the culture like in that sense, you know, to, to deliver excellency all the time? Yeah, I think it's really not, you know, if it's having good intuition and if something doesn't feel right, you just don't ship it. You just have that, you know, that attention to the customer experience that is above, you know, financial KPIs and you just strive for that. And it's very easy to... You know, I mean, I, I think there are so many other companies that they don't have that. They, they keep pushing products out and they don't have that sensitivity towards striving for excellence, striving for uh, the best customer experience ever. And there are, you know, sometimes to deliver that level of, you know, experience, it requires to do a lot, a lot of work. And... People don't, people shadow that, but, you know, you need to be obsessed with delivering the best customer experience to, to be able to do that, to be able to 
do all the work that is needed to deliver that. Yeah. I'm always curious about thinking frameworks and first principles that listeners uh, can take away, right? And then they can uh, they can somehow implement in their own uh, in their own life. Uh, so I'm curious to know if you have a particular thinking structure or frameworks that you use consistently in your job to to help you guide your your action and keep this level of uh, curiosity and excellency that is required to do your job yeah that's an excellent question i mean you know i think working in technology requires you to to do different things one is you know looking at upcoming technologies and you know using these waves to propel you so you know if Spatial computing is coming is really about understanding it and learning about it and embracing the medium. The same, you know, we can say for AI, if AI is coming, is looking for what's happening, understanding the medium again, and really looking at which tools do, you know, are, av- are available for me to, you know, input my craft, whatever your craft is, is your craft is computer science, if your craft is design, if your craft is, you know, video making you can look at which tools are enabling me to use that my craft and and it converge into this new into this new medium and i think this is a frame of thinking that i think is very helpful to be on the fringe of this wave we can talk about the philosophy of that you know that gives you you know being part of the dominant you know, technological wave is, I think, brings you sometimes, you know, satisfaction and visibility and is is really exciting. Then from another perspective, we can think philosophically about that and about where we have come uh, as a technology industry, where we have prioritized convenience, simplicity rather than, you know, empowerment. And, you know, I think convenience comes at a cost. And so I think in that sense, there is there is there, is, there are a lot of things that you know are emerging at least in my way of thinking in my framework in which i criticize also the the direction that technology has taken so i think the 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 framework thinking is you know follow the wave be on the fringe that gives you a lot of satisfaction and you are part of you know the this wave moving forward but then i think on the other side you know looking at where that is taking us from a you know technology industry, but really you can see how much technology influences everyone. So I, so I think being also critical and be able to understand what are the consequences of you know what what we have we, what we are doing. And I think convenience is one of these aspects, one of these engines that has been propelled the technology industry for I would say from the beginning of you know, the, or at, for at least the last 20 years. And I think, you know, having convenience as this engine for technology is something that I'm very critical of. And I think people can use as a reflection as well. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned this before in the podcast, uh, like one of my pet peeve uh, um, is that I don't often hear people that work in technology ask uh, those type of questions. And, and think about the impact. And partly it's because we are not trained, right, to do so. Uh, that, that I think is part, part of the problem. But I feel like that the level of awareness uh, now it's increasing. And, and I think it's really good that we are starting to have this type of conversation. And, and going back to the, to the headset, uh, Apple Vision Pro topic, uh, how how do you think uh, the release of this device uh, will change the way we we interact uh, with technology and uh, and with each other as well right cuz uh, like the background of this i remember when i when i was a kid i used to play outside you know and be outside of the time and then i remember the mobile phone appearing like i'm i'm, I'm older than i look 
Mm. I'm missing. <laughs> okay. So I remember like the first mobile mobile phones, like the Nokia, you know, 90, was it 9020? I don't remember. Like something like that, right? Uh, I think I had a 3310. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, um, and like I got my first phone when I was 10, uh, I think. Yeah. I got my first phone when I was 10. And, and back then there was no touch screen or, or anything. It was like a normal phone. But I started to carry this phone with me everywhere I went, right? Uh, so all my life was tied to, to a phone. And then again, uh, I think my life uh, changed, uh, like the life of everyone, when we started to have uh, smartphones. So they were not mobile phones anymore. They were smartphones. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, we had social media, right? And we could communicate uh, uh, with pictures and use apps. Uh, and that changed again. So much so that right now, if I lose my phone, uh, I feel like I lose a piece of myself. Uh, like, like I lost my hand or something. So literally, today we live tied to a phone. Now I see the headset coming and uh, I'm thinking, okay, so instead of having a phone and being tied to a phone, moving forward, I'm going to go around, like even outside with, you know, with these huge headsets, right? Uh, plugged, uh, plugged with me. And of course, this is iteration one. They're going to get better. Maybe they'll find a way to have the battery. Right now, the battery is separate uh, and you have to put it in your pocket. You know, maybe they'll find a way to put it uh, somewhere in the actual device. And maybe sometimes uh, in the near future, we won't even have a device. Uh, we will live in a fully blended uh, reality with technology, right? Uh, we won't have any separation anymore or any device uh, in which... Uh, uh, you know, separate us from, from technology. Like maybe that's our next step in the evolution as well as a species. So maybe this is like uh, me fantasizing and watching too many movies, uh, but, I, <laughs> but I want to know uh, your take on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, I think, I think these are a great question. I do think that if you look at this, you know, if, if you think about headset and about... This side of technology that wants to own your attention fully, right? It's like you are completely immersed. You are completely inside this computing environment. You are separated physically, even if you know you have cameras. Imagine this is transparent, is you know like a piece of eyewear. But I do believe that you know the this trajectory that is bringing more and more you know, convenience, at some point it breaks and it breaks kind of structurally. I think we are already, you know, seeing levels of, you know, disconnection. People are lonely and they are the loneliest they've been. There are, you know, we have the teenage generation that grows up with computers with enormous problems because of this mediation and also because of, you know, the cameras being everywhere and not, you know, not having the right to forget. So I think these aspects are really, really impactful on the way we think. You know, as you were talking about, we have, you know, we build technology and technology is an extension of our senses, but also, you know, technology shapes us back. And I think this, I am quoting Marshall McLuhan, that is this big theory is that, you know, I propose this is like, we build technology and then technology shapes us. I think in the more kind of philosophical and you know, media theory domain, people are kind of debating even that relationship in which, you know, the technology industry is in this in the hands of few, and you know, the technology is shaping us more than we shape the technology. And sometimes it feels like there is this snowballing effect in which it feels like there is this direction that has been given by science fiction of what needs to be built, and there is very little imagination to go away from what is the expected. And I think the content is also not, you know, the, the content is not as beautiful, not as poetic, not as artistic. I think we have, we have lost those aspects that for me were part of computing and they are being reshuffled in a kind of plainer, less deeper, like, yeah, more shallow way. And so I think, 
that is something that we can react to and you know be aware of and recognize and and I think some technology like this the vision pro I don't imagine that to be the future I imagine this to be you know an interaction with technology but not being technology itself I imagine that you know I'm on a plane I don't like that I'm going to just wear a headset and that's going to be my experience with that but I don't imagine that to be the way uh, reality is mediated with me and I think I don't want to enter in the social dilemma the space here but I do think that recognizing what are the engines behind technology I think convenience and simplicity are some of them I'm a big critic of those especially of convenience to be above you know there is nothing wrong about that but when that is above you know it's it's above some, some principles of you know beauty or is above some you know joy of ownership i don't i think we use in our in our lingo users we talk about customers i like to talk about owners of technology i own this piece of technology it's mine and i can make what i want out of it i think that's something that i think people are starting to to are starting to feel that there is a disconnection there and so i in my projection of what i think a positive future is uh, you know i imagine technology to be you know we will have this high end experiences but i think there is a low tech universe in which you can have you know, potentially projections and spatial computing, those could be could be one way in which is less resolution, but is a lot more friendly as a technology and allows different ways of interacting that are not so divisive. And so that space I mentioned before about collective computing, about being able to interact with one system, but being multiple people, I think is something I'm really interested in. I think creating tools that allow people to create rather than consume, I think that's something that I, I believe in too. And I think there is more needed there. So anyway, this is, I think there are, there are, there are directions, there are trajectories that are pointing at different, different possibilities of this future. And I hope that, you know, we are not going to be all wearing headsets and walking around the city. I hope so. I hope not too, but I hope as well that I, I won't have a chip maybe implanted in my brain to do so. <laughs> oh, you know, who knows, right? Uh, but I am kind of fascinated by what you what what you said uh, right now, and particularly about about several things. But one of the things that stood out the most was earlier when you said that. We lost the creativity when we think about technology, right? Uh, and your concept of uh, that it feels like um, everything is charted already, you know, but science fiction. Uh, so how do we do, do we get back this type of creativity and how do we shift from being a consumer, right, to owner of technology? Because I agree with you, it very much feels like technology impacts uh, our choices uh, and our life way more than we think. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I think I, if I think about the, you know, the latest advances in AI, for instance, we have this, you know, generative images, you can create a prompt and you can generate an image. And that for me is this like uh, I, I cannot imagine anything more kind of human and satis you know creating a lot of satisfaction of sitting down and drawing something and understanding that's something that you can learn if you're not good at drawing and I think our educational system really index on analytical thinking and you know we, we are very good at being analytical and you know we have tests in school we have a lot of you know more and more things that are quantifiable and so we are basically discounting our right side of the brain that is the more creative one that is about you know music and drawing and poetry and i feel like we live in a society where we have very little of that or we are tending to have very little of that you know we have chat gpt that where you can prompt and you can say give me a you know 
uh, this in the style of Dante and it just spits it out for you. While instead, I believe that for me, the role of technology is helping you to have this extension of your brain in some way, right? It's a general purpose machine that can do everything you can imagine. And you can, you know, if you understand the medium, you can project any of your ideas and it can, you know, whatever it is, you can make videos, uh, you can transform, you can make mathematical equations. You, you, it's really a, a wide open medium. And so I think, how do we get it back? I mean, I think it's demanding and looking for, yeah, and you know, underdogs that are offering that. And I, I look at the open source community as one of the places where that is for me very positive. One of the, you know, one of the principles that I use for, you know, the ethics of my practice, the ethics of interaction design and prototyping, is is this idea of you know using open source tools for instance and you know open source tools yield open source ideas or you know they tend to have open ideas so that that's one way in which you know that's that's one way in which you kind of detach the direction that seems charted and and you see different possibilities so i think that that's one one domain i hope that we will see more and more alternatives to the computing models that we have today. And, you know, some that embraced this idea of, you know, that look into the consumption of resources that you have for, for building things that allow, you know, a simple way to enter, but also there is a high ceiling. So you can just like, you know, go deeper in that medium, understand it very well, take stock on it. And then, yeah, the idea of openness, the idea of long lastingness, I think those are all things that I think there is a big potential for them and there is a big ask for them. So I think as a direction, I think those are things I hope that multiple companies are going to give that as an offering, as alternatives. Pierre, we, we are at the end of our conversation. Is there any parting thoughts for listeners or Things that I haven't asked you, but that you think it's worth mentioning. You know, I mean, coming from the conversation that we were just having, I mean, I think, I think the takeaway that I want, maybe that, I don't know, maybe the, the, the last thing that I would just reiterate is, you know, there are this wave of technology, you can ride them and you're probably going to be successful at least in the short term. But then, you know, if you look long term and you think about, does this help me, you know, or does this help, you know, the world, we working on this, is it going to yield more, you know, whales in the ocean or more birds in the sky? And I think that way of thinking grounds you a bit and gives a dimension to your thinking or a framework of thinking that you know balances the advances of technologies and with you know the reality of today we have wildfires there are you know i've lived through an orange sky that is a pretty surreal experience and some people in new york are experiencing it yesterday i think and so if we look at you know the world not as a you know, islands, but as a system and everything is connected in that system, we have a part of it. Um, looking at what are the engines that move specific things, is it to make things more convenient? Is it to make things simpler? But what is the cost of that? And so looking at what is the energy of that? What is, you know, the loss of what are we losing? With every technology, we lose something. What are we losing? And going to gauge that before you jump into something I think is very important. So that that's that's maybe the only thing I would add. Thank you. I really appreciate you sharing this uh, this final thought with us. Pierre, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, we covered uh, many topics uh, and uh, I think there there couldn't have been a most uh, beautiful way to to end it. Uh, so Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you very much. Really enjoy being here. So see you soon. Yeah. And for listeners, I'll see you on the next episode. Bye. 
That's all from today's episode. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you find this episode valuable, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the Polyweb podcast on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. It would be fantastic if you could leave us a rating, a review, or a comment, as this really helps other listeners find the show. All the resources mentioned in this episode will be linked in the description and in the show notes. See you on the next episode. And if you cannot wait until next week, you can watch this episode right here that relates to some of the things that we talk about in this episode. Bye.